So our next presenter is Stephen Priestley, Managing Director and Head of Financial Services, CDC Group. Stephen's been at CDC since January 2019 and currently heads the Financial Services Group team, which oversees CDC's investment activity via financial institutions and into financial services. Prior to his current role, Stephen was the regional head of global banking for Africa, Middle East, and Pakistan at Standard Chartered. Stephen. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you very much for the organizers to give me the opportunity to speak about CDC's approach to financial sector development. Um, but firstly, let me give you a little bit of context about CDC for those of you who may not be familiar with the organization. Um, CDC is the UK government's invest, uh, development finance arm established more than 50 years ago. We have a mandate to invest only in the private sector and only in Africa and South Asia. And we seek to make sort of financial investments through debt and equity um, into corporates, financial services companies, and into funds that we believe have the potential to make lasting economic and social impact. So importantly, for the purpose of this conversation, it's important to note that the investment must also earn a financial return. We believe that the commercial rigor that goes into making an investment decision will actually uh, ensure that the the, the, the impact that we're trying to pursue has a, a, long, a, a chance of lasting much longer um, through a volatile economic changes. Um, we are not a private equity house, and we're not a, also we're not a, a grantor of concessional capital. Um, so basically, in order to really give you a feel for how CDC goes about investing in financial sector development, I think I'm going to just make some observations about what's crafted and shaped the financial markets in Africa for the last 10 years, both positive and negative. Um, I think these factors are all well known to you, but it, it really it has influenced our thinking about our strategy and how we go about investing in the sector. So we, we continue to see capital flight from Africa. Um, we see it in the FDI, reduction of FDI flows. We've seen it in the reduction of international capital into the private equity industry. We've even seen it in the reduction of capital into the lowest risk asset class, trade finance. So these are quite disturbing macro trends that we've seen over the last two or three years, all just accentuated by COVID. We've also seen international banks leave the marketplace. So Basel III, Basel IV coming, basically has made the capital requirements on these banks um, the RWA calculations become uneconomic. And then you layer over the regulations requirements around AML and KYC, and international banks' appetite for, for banking in Africa reduces materially. Then you move to the regional and local tier one banks and try and understand how their business models work. Um, effectively, um, most of these tier one banks target the top tier corporates where the risk return uh, trade-off is, is favorable. Um, they take good quality deposits um, and then whatever is left over from not lending out to the mid-market, they put in very attractive high-yielding T-bills. Um, so if you're a shareholder of a, of, a, of a bank in Africa, this is a very sensible high ROE business model. The challenge, however, um, and I think this is clear to everybody, is it leaves a massive unmet credit demand in the middle of the market. So many estimates, but roughly around $240 billion of credit to SMEs go unmet in Africa every year. And then you've moved to the retail side of the business. 66% of Africa is underbanked or unbanked. Um, I recently was told that in South Africa, the most developed capital market, 70% of South African adults do not have a savings account. So the degree of underbanked um, levels on the continent are the highest in the world. 
Then you go and look at see, you know, how local governments are financing themselves. And we heard in the earlier panel how governments basically are crowding out, and there seems to be no sign of this changing, crowding out the local uh, credit provision in, in these economies. They have high current account deficits, high budget deficits, which lead to funding in the T-bill market driving up those costs. So the cost of credit is very high, and therefore the, the credit creation into the, into the real economy as a percentage of GDP in Africa is the lowest uh, of any continent. So that's, that, that's what's shaped um, the African financial sector for the past couple of decades. Um, but the good news is um, we see a lot of good reasons for why this can change. Basically, um, it's, the, it's the explosion of digital infrastructure um, and how this is rolling across the continent. We've seen, um, and everybody has talked about for several years now, the adoption of mobile telephony and even now the transition from 4G to 5G. We've seen the explosion of handsets, the more sophisticated versions, and the adoption of these handsets in more and more remote rural areas. We've seen small data centers scaling up into larger data hubs, enabling cloud-based services and new business models that are beginning to proliferate um, in markets like Nigeria, Egypt, and Kenya. We've also seen blockchain and cryptocurrency being sometimes disturbingly fast uh, adopted in certain African economies uh, way ahead of regulation. But that's the good news, and what it's resulted in is, is a proliferation of new business models that we feel uh, are the sector that has the most opportunity to transform the financial sector in Africa. It's the emergence of new challenger models uh, in financial services that are basically providing the full spectrum of financial services, from remittances to payments to cash in, cash out, credit models, new credit models, basically challenging the incumbent banks. The incumbent banks, as we all know, are sort of weighed down by legacy technology and very expensive retail networks. While these new challenger models have the opportunity to deploy new technology and techniques like AI, um, cloud computing, and robotic processes. So this allows them to reduce the cost to service um, and tackle a much larger scale and go after uh, the unbanked with products and services that are more affordable and accessible. So, and they're also very clever and smart at adopting mobile telephony as a way of accessing these underbanked populations. So investors are taking note on this. I think there are several panels around the room today and tomorrow um, talking about fintech. And you know, if you can just see how, how already this year, in the first half of this year, more money was raised in African fintech than the whole of last year put together. So if these are the trends that we're seeing, both positive and negative, CDC's approach to financial sector development um, really takes in a couple of different um, methods. But firstly, just to give you a sense of the scale, um, currently we have about $1.4 billion invested in financial services across the continent. Um, and that's through a range of different channels and products. We're aiming to put to work just under half a billion dollars into financial services in Africa each year, either via financial institutions or into financial institutions. So we, we, when we invest in financial institutions, what we really try and focus on is to help drive structural change and, and capture these improvements that will bring affordable financial services to these underserved segments. Uh, when it comes to direct equity, um, we are identifying these challenger business models, and this does include early stage fintech platforms um, that really are looking to transform the provision of financial services, and we invest equity in them at quite early stages. The idea, our strong belief is, is these new business models that will challenge the legacy system that we see not providing the real service the financial sector needs to on the continent. 
So we're not looking any longer to really invest in listed banks, um, which we have done successfully in the past, but more into relatively early stage platforms. And these are digital consumer banks serving the unbanked using high-tech, high-touch models. Um, we are seeing, as you know, we've seen it in Latin America, we've seen it in South Asia, the rise of these neo-cloud-based uh, banks, and we're beginning to see this primarily in the four big economies in Africa, of Egypt, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. And we think there will be a proliferation of these over the next three or four years. When we, the second way we deploy equity into the financial sector is through equity into funds as an LP. So we target LPs that have the highest, best-in-class financial performance in the financial institutions sector. Um, and really, the idea here is that we want to leverage their capabilities and skills and networks on the ground and their, their domain expertise, whether it be in payments or in insurance, and, and to really give them capital to invest in, in, in a, in a, in a subsector of the financial services that we think they're best equipped to get capital and generate an attractive return to try and make the demonstration effect to international investors that there is a successful model that is possible in private equity in Africa. And APIS and Leapfrog are two such examples of, of these, these managers that we've backed. So then we invest via financial institutions. And, and in this instance, this is really to try and channel liquidity and facilitate trade into specific targeted areas. We do this where we see a bank putting capital to work in a smart way in underserved segments. Um, but they have limited risk appetite. So we provide capital through them that in fact allows them to do more of the same than they otherwise would. And so in some ways we're renting or leveraging their banking infrastructure to use our capital to get to these segments more effectively. Um, and we, you know, we, we're happy to pay a fee uh, for that service. Um, and we've done that with several um, partners across the continent including ABSA, who's here today, but also Standard Chartered Bank, TDB, Afrex, and, and, and many, many others. Um, and we feel that this is a good way of trying to encourage the banks to go into parts of the African continent that they only have a limited amount of risk appetite for, but by us co-investing alongside them, um, that will enable them to do more. And we do this through risk sharing um, and guarantees, which I'll say a bit more about now. Um, for these banks, uh, very selectively, we will also provide tier one and tier two capital um, in order to give their balance sheets a little bit more firepower to invest in, in the sectors that we hope they're going to grow into and not just stay at the top quality credits that has happened over the past couple of decades. We also look at directed uh, lending um, capital. So we'll often go to a bank in Africa and say, um, we would like to lend you money for a specific purpose, um, and it's primarily to go after three areas. It's to look at putting capital into gender finance, climate finance, and financing of that middle market, the SMEs, which has got such a huge credit gap. Um, and we'll do this on a funded basis or on an unfunded basis, depending upon the needs of that, um, of that bank um, when we provide the guarantees. And it also hopefully allows us to, to target local currency lending, which is in many instances more appropriate uh, than US dollar financing. The third area that we focus on, and we're quite uh, unique in doing this as a DFI, is promoting trade finance and supply chain finance in Africa. Um, it, it is a, it's a um, very important capital flow that we've seen reduced recently, uh, um, even before COVID. Um, and in some of the smaller, fragile states on the continent, um, we see many banks either reluctant to or unable to raise wholesale capital 
to put into trade and supply chain finance in these smaller economies. So in this instance, we will often provide guarantees or do market risk, risk participation agreements with banks to try and encourage them to deploy capital for the purposes of trade finance. And this is trade intra-Africa as well as across the rest of the, uh, in, into the rest of the world um, in a way that allows the cost of trade and the availability of that capital to go down. Um, and we are a believer that by trying to demonstrate the, the relative cost and re risk return dynamics on the trade asset in Africa, um, commercial investors will come back into this asset class having left it over the last 18 months. So alongside our efforts around trade, the last sort of real pillar of our efforts in financial sector development I want to talk about is our efforts in supporting uh, private credit as an asset class in Africa. Um, there are several panels about this today, but um, we believe that this will in part replace some of the, the, the bank risk appetite that has created a market dislocation uh, on the continent. And in some ways we feel that private credit as an asset class can replace the banking credit that has left the continent. We have seen this very, very uh, starkly in Europe and in the United States, where private credit has basically filled the vacuum where the banks have left the real economy um, in, 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 large, in large amounts. So it's, a, it's now a trillion dollar business across the United States and Europe. And we actually see no reason why this as an asset class cannot happen um, on the African continent. So to this aim, we've recently backed two private credit funds, recently uh, in the course of this year. One was Vantage Mezzanine Fund, and the second was we acted as a cornerstone investor in Blue Peak Private Capital. So we, we think there are, um, our, our objective is to at least uh, back three or four more of these funds in the next 12, 18 months. Um, and there are many more, um, and we feel like if if they are successful in raising the capital, this will bring at least a billion dollars of capital to the continent over the next couple of years, targeting this mid-market segment that can raise um, responsibly um, dollar debt and service it. In many ways, private credit is better suited as a, as a capital than private equity. Um, and we feel the objective is really here to, to attract global uh, international capital into this asset class, because of its characteristics, uh, we think it will uh, generate an attractive risk-adjusted return for international investors over the coming five or six years. So um, it was interesting in the last panel um, and the last questions, if you were listening to it, around e ESG. Um, so we do spend a huge amount of time um, at CDC thinking about how to complement our capital and provide value-added services to the financial service companies that we invest in or back. And we do believe that um, whether um, it's consumer protection policies or whether it's, it's new product development around gender financing or climate financing, um, there's a big role that CDC as well as other DFIs can play in providing technical assistance to all sorts of African financial services companies, whether they're early stage startups or large scale international banks um, on the continent in trying to improve ESG practices across the continent in a way that actually does, um, we believe strongly, uh, create value if nothing else. It allows a company to be more robust and command a higher multiple when it comes to trying to sell itself um, um, once it's uh, reached that point. So we do, sp we do spend a, a huge amount of time on ESG, gender finance, and climate finance in helping financial institutions um, get ready and, and profitably put capital to work in those sectors. So hopefully this has given you a better understanding of how CDC 
uh, goes about investing in financial services um, and how we really do hope that the, the, the sector will transform um, over the couple of years, taking advantage of uh, the explosion of digital infrastructure, um, new business models um, that will challenge the legacy systems that we've been living with for the past couple of decades. So that's, uh, thank you for the time, but I, I, we have a couple more minutes for questions, if there are any, which I'm happy to, to field. I don't know if there's a mic that, that um, they're, they're just bringing a mic. Okay, my name is Bashir from Nigeria. And would you would you guarantee bonds or sukuk, for example? Would you provide guarantees for bonds or sukuk, or would you have the right such? Thanks. We, we, I mean, we the, under certain circumstances we would. Um, the 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 issuer of the bond and the use of proceeds um, would have to be carefully, you know, um, we would have to agree with those. Those the proceeds and the issuance, and um, the sukuk aspect of it is actually really interesting and something that we are looking at quite carefully. Um, but it's more; it would come down to more: um, who is the issuer, um, what is the use of proceeds, and can we actually mobilise capital from the private sector into that bond, and what role would CDC play do in in investing in that bond? So if we can we can satisfy the fact that we would be providing additionality. Um, and not crowding out the private sector, um, then, yeah, we would certainly look at it. But those are the sort of conditions that we would need to satisfy ourselves with. Sure. Hi, Stephen. Aubrey Hi. Ruby, pleasure to see you again. Um, Hi. I couldn't agree more on the credit funds, and I feel like we've been talking about private credit funds for five, ten years. What's holding them back? Why has it taken so long for this asset class to develop? And second question, um, it takes about three to five years on average to raise an African private equity fund. How can there be innovation among the DFIs to reduce the cost of raising a fund for first time fan, fund managers in particular? Well, um, thanks and good to see you again. Those are, those are two questions that a conference could both sort of fill, I suspect. But um, pri I mean, it's a very good question around private credit. It is a mystery to me. Um, I've been a banker for 20 years, and I look at that business model, and I think private credit is, is a very compelling model. And maybe we just haven't done a really good enough story on focusing on it and actually explaining the risk-return trade-offs to international investors. Or maybe we've just had, had bad timing. I mean, I think there's a lot, of, there's a lot to be said about taking a... a a proposition to the international investor community when there's, there's momentum behind the, the investing in emerging markets. Just that alone is a, is, a, um, is a big issue. And I think that's, you know, I think the macro picture has, has sort of been the noise that has stopped private credit as an asset class really taking off. Um, at CDC, we're determined to actually really um, make, make the case together with our DFI colleagues um, and to make the case with international commercial investors. Um, and, and so, you know, we're confident over the next few years that it will happen. Um, to answer your second question, um, that is a much longer, I mean, that is a very uh, a complex issue. Um, and I do think there is recognition uh, that, you know, a traditional Western private equity model does need to adapt more, more, more fundamentally to the realities of the African marketplace. And that will hopefully um, reduce the time and the, the risk that asset manager, uh, that GPs face when they try and raise capital. Um, and I, there is a huge amount of work and studies going into how, what are the constraints around the private equity model. Um, and there are many, but, um, but there are also many successful examples um, that I think is important to, to sort of understand what's made them successful and how can we replicate it. But um, not trying to dodge the question, but I will come back to you on, I mean, that is a much longer discussion. 
please. Christopher Hartland Peel. Um, on your website, on the CDC website, that is, there's um, an announcement earlier this month of $100 million which CDC is putting in with Africa Development Partners to make a total of a billion dollars. Could you put that in the context of your balance sheet and how that's going to be employed on these, on these large and medium-sized companies in Africa? Yeah, no, I think that's refer you're referring to the Development Partners uh, private equity firm, which, yes, they did raise a billion, which is really uh, fantastic news. And, and a huge congratulations to the team. Um, CDC's contribution to that was less than 10%. So it, it is a, we, we try and act as a, um, as, a, as a catalytic investor into some of these funds, um, while not, and hopefully attracting uh, commercial capital at the same time, which clearly was the case uh, in this instance. So it, it's a, it's a, I mean, I think our investment was about $100 million out of the billion. Um, so yes, less than 10% of the fund. Um, and as a percentage of CDC, um, less than 1%. I think we've run out of time. So thank you very much for your time and attention and enjoy the conference.